morning, everyone. Welcome to our um, October 31st, All Hallows Eve um, service. And uh, hello to everyone on online. Uh, is there any announcements other than the ones that we have already printed? Any announcements uh, remotely? No? Okay. Okay, that being said. Oh, yes, Janet. Congratulations. What's the baby's name? Grace, fifth generation. Okay, any other announcements? Any, any, anything else? Okay. That being said, let us uh, join together to the call to worship. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to go with the songs of praise. Okay, our next hymn is Rise Up, O Men of God. If you would like to follow along in the hymnal, it's on page 576. If you'd like to follow along in the opening prayer. O mysterious God, who hides in the shadows of our steps, who surprises in ways inexplicable, who lingers in paradox, ignite our spirits to reveal in your presence, inspire our souls to dance in your mystery, free our minds to rest in your holiness, be comforted, totally quiet, completely yours. In the name of Christ, the mysterious word made flesh. Amen. Okay, before our scripture lesson, I believe we have a short video. Sure, it'll be coming shortly. It's embedded in the power of
Yeah, so you just double, if you click once through and then one more time. Twelfth chapter of Mark, verses 28 through 34. One of the legal experts heard their dispute and saw how well Jesus answered them. He came over and asked him, what commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, the most important one is Israel. Listen, our God is the one Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, that you love your neighbor as yourself. No commandment is greater than these. The legal expert said to him, well said, teacher. You have truthfully said that God is the one and there is no other besides him. And to love God with all the, of the heart, all a full understanding and all of one's strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more important than all kinds of entire, entirely burned offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered with wisdom, he said to him, you aren't far from God's kingdom. After all, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The word of God for the people of God. All right, I'm gonna to have to tell the story of the video, although it's not hugely important, but it is kind of funny if we ever, someday I'll see if I can get it for you some other time. But today is Reformation Sunday. Today is uh, October 31st, and it marks the day that Martin Luther nailed up the 95 theses or theses on the door of the church um, protesting. So that's how we get the Protestant churches, the Protestant movement but um, protesting or at least wanting to discuss the ways that he thought that the Catholic church was not being faithful uh, to scripture or to, to, well, to the Bible. Okay. Um, you might recall if you know anything about that time of history, that there was sort of widespread use of the selling of indulgences, right? So people believed the church told people, right? That when you died, you ended up going to purgatory. So this kind of waiting room, <laughs> not really heaven, not really hell, you're just kind of in this place, which isn't mentioned in the Bible. But anyway, the church made this, right? And so you were kind of in this waiting, this limbo area. Um, I don't even really know what you were doing. You're evaporating sin or something like that until at some point you were okay and then you could go um, up to heaven, but your, fr your friends and family down below who were still alive could speed up that process, right? They could get you out of this waiting room by giving the church money, by selling indulgences. And so um, you can imagine that this was a big fundraiser for the Catholic church. Um, a lot of 
the really wonderful cathedrals and churches out in Europe were funded in this way. Basically, people trying to buy their loved ones out of purgatory and into heaven. And so Martin Luther, who was a monk at that point, um, had read the Bible and didn't think that this was really actually kosher, didn't think that this was really part of scripture and wanted to discuss this. And so type, you know, amongst other things, nailed these 95 questions or statements up to the church wall. And so he was promptly uh, persecuted for it because he's challenging the existing power system. And there was a trial and basically he was declared um, a heretic and they looked for his arrest and he went into hiding, okay? So when he went into hiding and the electors canceled, one of the things that he did, which is what, what what I really was showing the video for. One of the things that he did while he was there was up to that point, the Bible was only really available in two languages. It was only available in Greek and it was available in Latin. Latin being the official language of the Roman Catholic Church. And so if you were part of the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy, priest, bishop, archbishop, cardinal, pope, or whatever, Right? You, knew, you knew how to speak Latin. But the average person, right? the average person wandering around their village doing whatever they were doing did not speak Latin. And so it was up to the priest, it was up to the priest, it was up to the Catholic church to tell everybody what the Bible said because they couldn't read it for themselves. And so purgatory, indulgences, um, the structure of the Roman Catholic Church, all these things. At that point in history, the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope wielded more political power and more material wealth than some nations at that time, many nations at that time. So Martin Luther is in hiding. And one of the things that he does is he translates the Bible into German, into his native tongue. And so that act makes the Bible accessible to the common person to be able to read, right? But, and I guess I should say, and, and combined with an invention of that time, the printing press. The printing press makes it, a, makes it so that we can distribute the Bible in mass quantities. It doesn't have to be hand copied anymore. So now I can distribute it for everybody, and I can read it. It's in your native tongue, right? And suddenly this presents, this presents an awesome, wonderful opportunity and it presents a challenge. The awesome, wonderful opportunity is that this abuse of power, this ownership of the Bible that the Roman Catholic Church has enjoyed and interpreted, okay, is broken. You and me can read scripture. You and me can read scripture and we can hold the church accountable. We can hold the leadership accountable. We can form the church in our faith in ways that are faithful to scripture because now we can all read it. So you can't tell me that it costs $500 to get my loved one out of purgatory when there's no mention of purgatory or the price to get my, my, my loved one out. So in a way, this is a really good thing, right? This makes the word of God available to everybody. We can read it for ourselves. And one of the big things that Martin Luther realizes as part of the Reformation is that it is not through the purchase of indulgences. It is not through lifting up cathedrals that we are saved, but we are saved by faith alone. Faith alone in Jesus Christ. That is the tagline for the Protestant movement, right? Saved by faith alone. So, good thing. Moves the faith out of that hierarchy and moves it to be more, in, more accessible to everybody, right? And in some sense, that is why Jesus came to earth, to make God and God's presence more accessible to all of us, okay? But the challenge, there's a challenge here too. The challenge here is everybody can read the Bible and everybody can interpret it for themselves. You might know with Meth as Methodists in 1968, when we um, merged with the EUB, and I believe this was an EUB congregation, 
that something came out of those proceedings called the Wesley quadrilateral, okay? Wesley never created the quadrilateral, but it was a way to talk about our faith. It's a way to talk about our faith where we say scripture is still the most important thing to our faith, but we also want to apply our reason, the traditions of the church and our understandings and our personal experience in understanding our faith and being able to talk about our faith, right? So people are bringing their reason, their experience and looking at scripture and so are starting to come up with all kinds of interesting interpretations. Now, if you think about the day we, the, the, the day and age we live in, right? Think, okay, so I want you to think of your favorite controversial Christian subject, abortion, human sexuality, stem cell research, vaccine, whatever you want, okay? I want you to think about that. And without taking a side, I'm not going to take a side, but I want you to think about the argument that's presented by whatever your favorite side is. And I will almost guarantee you that your favorite side points to the Bible and says that scripture supports their position. They will say, scripture supports my position because they have to, they have to point to scripture and say that, right? My favorite story out of this is as a much younger person, the first class I took in seminary, was taking an Old Testament class and we were reading the stories that came after exodus okay so exodus you remember moses leads the israelites out of bondage into the wilderness they they grumble they and so they're all cursed god says okay none of you over the age of 20 or something like that are going to go into the promised land this whole generation has got to die out and then the next generation following joshua will end up possessing the land that God has promised that God promised Moses on the mountain, a land flowing with milk and honey. Right. And so when it's time, the Israelites go into the land of Canaan with the power of God and conquer the land. In some cases, they're told to wipe out the residents in the land of Canaan. Right. They're told to wipe out the land and possess it. And that becomes the nation of Israel. So when we think of that story, when you hear that story, who are we? We are God's people, aren't we? We are God's people. God made a covenant with us through Moses. God promised that land to us. And so this story is the fulfillment of that promise. It's proof that God is faithful. It's proof that God is forgiving, right? Even though the Israelites grumbled and moaned and whatever, God still gave them the land. God still formed them into a nation for his purposes, right? God was still faithful. God still loved them. God, it's a victory, right? It's a victory that they possessed the land of Canaan. That's the story. That's the story that I would preach up here, okay? When I was in my Old Testament class, I read a paper. I read a paper from a Christian Native American theologian. Christian Native American theologian. And his paper essentially was this. Be careful how you interpret this story. Because when you come to a Native American community and you tell that story, and tell that story about how great God is and how wonderful and how loving God is, Native Americans may not hear that story and put, them, put, put themselves in the position of the Israelites. They may put themselves in the position of the Canaanites. They may put themselves in the position of the people that were thrown off their land for no reason who were killed, who had their societies destroyed, their cities destroyed for no reason other than God said that some other occupying people needed to move in. So all their women, all their livestock, all their children destroyed by the God that you are coming in and telling me loves me. So when I, as a Native American, when I read that story, I don't hear victory. I don't see a God of love 
and a God of covenant. I see a violent, arbitrary, unjust God who took away the Canaanites' land for no reason and gave it to somebody else. That's the story that you can hear if you are Native American and read that part of scripture. Which of those interpretations is correct? Truth is they're both correct, right? The truth is, is that we bring our own personalities, our own experiences, our own traditions. When we read scripture, we bring all those things in. When we read and hear people's stories, we bring in our biases, our understandings, our inclinations. We bring all of that when we read scripture. And so it's no surprise that now that it's available to everybody, that we have very, very conflicting views on what scripture says about a whole host of topics that are very complex. Abortion, stem cell research, any of those things that people come up with different interpretations. 10 commandments, thou shall not kill. And yet I'm sitting in a, if I'm sitting in a situation where abortion is an option and I have to choose between killing a fetus and killing the mother, that's not an easy question, right? And scripture doesn't give you a checklist on how to decide that problem, right? So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? This morning, we have a scripture passage that I think is the concept I think will be very familiar to us. That out of the 621 laws or whatever, I've, whatever the number is in Old Testament, there's this huge body of laws. God is, you know, the first five books of the Bible, God has given all these laws to the Israelites and said, this is how we're going to set you apart. This is how you're going to become a distinct people, right? 651 laws, right? If I can just tell you, I'm sure you all agree with this. In this country, we have bodies of laws. And some of those laws are absolute sacred laws, right? Murder is one of the laws that we, because the deprivation of somebody's life is something we consider to be a horrible thing. Laws against killing somebody are things that will be enforced in this country, right? We enforce those laws. Meanwhile, when I came down Route 90 this morning to the area and the speed limit said 70 miles per hour, I can tell you that there were a lot of people that were not obeying the law, even at 70 miles an hour, okay? And then you've got the sort of ridiculous laws that sometimes stay on the books where, you know, you're not allowed to bathe your horse on Sunday you know, when there's a blue moon or something like that, right? So there really actually, if you think about it, there ends up being a hierarchy of laws for us in our country, right? There are some laws that we are absolutely going to enforce. And there are some laws that uh, will enforce-ish. And then there's a set of laws that we're not going to enforce at all. No, no police officer in the world is going to enforce this law, right? There's, there's a hierarchy, okay? And there's especially the hierarchy if there are laws that self-adherence is required. Okay, so we've got the 621 laws in the Old Testament. And this legal scholar comes up to Jesus and he, he virtually recognizes this. He says to Jesus, okay, so these 621 laws aren't all equal. Which one is the greatest? Which one is the greatest, right? And you all know the answer. We've all gone through Sunday school, right? Jesus says, the greatest is, is this, that you will love God with all your heart and all your, all your soul and all your mind. And you will love your neighbor as yourself. And I think this, so this, this part of the story, I think is just really funny. And so the legal expert, here's Jesus's answer. And the legal expert, Mark read it, the legal expert goes, you're right. You got the right answer. And I just, in my mind, because this is just me reading it through my lens, I'm just like, Jesus is sitting there going like, do you know who I am? 
do you know who I am, right? I got the halo up, I got all that stuff, right? Yeah, but Jesus is very gracious, right? A legal expert says, you are right. And Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. This legal expert. So Jesus says, yes, this is, so it's been affirmed, it's been answered, affirmed by the legal expert, affirmed again by Jesus, that this is the greatest commandment. Love God and love your neighbor, not or, okay? You can never have an interpretation of this commandment that puts love of God against love of neighbor. It can't be a choice of, well, the thing I'm doing shows that I love God, even though I am screwing over somebody, my neighbor, that's not right. It's an and, it's one commandment, love God and love your neighbor. So first off, any interpretation that puts those two things against one another is suspect. It's absolutely suspect. Second, if this is the greatest commandment, then we, I'm going to propose something to you, is that then we can use this commandment as the lens by which we read the rest, all the rest of scripture. There is no possibility of reading scripture in any way that contradicts this commandment. If you, if you, or you read something or you encounter somebody or, and they have a reading and interpretation of scripture that somehow does not love, respect, honor God and love, honor, respect neighbor as self. If there is an interpretation of scripture like that, okay, Scripture cannot contradict itself, not in matters of salvation. It cannot contradict itself, nor will Scripture contradict who God is. It cannot happen. If there is an interpretation that contradicts who God is or contradicts other parts of Scripture in matters of salvation, not historical fact, matters of salvation, then the problem lies with the interpretation, not with God or scripture. So we have to use that when we are trying to understand scripture. When we are reading the six passages that we talk about, that, that the church talks about, or parts of the church talk about prohibiting homosexuality. You have to read those passages through the lens of this commandment, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Will that give you a clear cut, no debate answer? Life's not, okay, unless your life is a lot better than mine, life isn't full of a lot of easy answers. There are a lot of moral, ethical dilemmas that we face, questions, questions about life and death, questions about right and wrong, questions about what scripture means and how do we interpret them and how do we live them. And anybody, and I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb as a pastor, anybody who gives you an easy answer hasn't thought through the problem. That's my take on it. Because life isn't that easy. There are multiple valid interpretations and understandings from any piece of scripture. I believe that. I believe that they are valid. I believe that what you, how the Holy Spirit moves you to understand and read a piece of scripture can be different for you and for you and for you. I believe that. I believe that that means that we can learn different things from pieces of scripture. I believe that scripture is alive through the Holy Spirit and helps grow us. But it's not a recipe book. It's not a cookbook. It's not a follow this and this happens and then do this and then that happens. It's a guide for living. It's a guide for being God's people. It's a guide for growing in the spirit, growing in our salvation, growing 
in our sanctification and becoming more and more like God every day. That's what it is. It teaches us those things. And those things require struggle. And those things require debate and rational debate informed by the Holy Spirit. And so I think that for me, one of the guiding things has been to try and read scripture through this lens. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. In the cases where there is doubt, and there are plenty of cases and interpretations where there is doubt, Again, the Bible isn't a laundry list, right? But where there is doubt, we have to lean toward love God, love your neighbor. How does that get expressed? How does that help me understand what this scripture says? That's the lens. If you're going to mess this up, if you're going to completely get the meaning of scripture wrong, then get it wrong by being biased toward loving God and loving neighbor. I am comfortable going before God and saying, okay, I messed up. But when I messed up, I leaned that direction. I didn't lean the direction of creating your church into a law following legalistic church, a rules based church. If you want to know my image of God's people and God's church, it is not a rules based Based church. It is a grace-based church. And we get to a grace-based church by loving God and loving neighbor as self. So may it all be so. May it be so with all of us. May it be so with all of God's people. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Oh, how he loves you and me from the in faith we sing him the number 2108. <laughs>